One-year program can be a tremendous opportunity to uh, leverage your education, and employers will view you as being ready to go. Uh, if you're a career starter, you've got to convince employers a little bit more, and that's why we encourage those students to get the internship. So I think that the one-year program versus two-year program decision should be driven by your own personal backgrounds and experiences and by what you believe you'll need in order to be successful. One of the key characteristics of anyone in business and that's critical for success is self-awareness. And it's just basically the idea that we can sit back and understand this is what I'm good at, this is where I need to improve, and if we do that honestly, it allows us to be more successful. So I'd say that I suspect in Europe that not every European is ready for a one-year program. Uh, and just as in the United States there are many students who could benefit from a one-year program, it should be an individual decision. And you can just look at how prepared you are and what your background is, and I suspect you'd be able to make the decision pretty easily. Uh, employers will do that one-year MBA as being absolutely equivalent to the two-year program if you've got the right mix of background skills. And we have many alumni who went through our one-year program who tell me that they like to hire CATS graduates because they know anyone who can get through the one-year program because it's so intense to accomplish anything in business. And that's one other element to keep in mind about a one-year program is you are going to be completely immersed in your education for that year. There's very little time to do anything else. So if you're someone who needs to have that time to think, you want to have a little bit of reading room, a one-year program may not be the right choice. But each of you can make it. And if you're aware, if you think about strengths and weaknesses, where you're sitting, um, you'll be able to make that choice very effectively and it will work from the employer's side. Thinking 
about it, you could end up making bad choices. Now, our advisors help students, but at the same time, that's the other side of it, it's the dilemma. Now, you asked the question about how valuable is work experience. Work experience makes a difference in the salary that you get after you have your MBA degree. People with more work experience get bigger salaries. So getting the work experience prior to business school effectively will guarantee that you'll have a higher salary when you go out. Now, in business school, you tend to have a high salary. I think we run about a 113% this year we're running higher than the pre-MBA salary. So after people get their MBA, their salary is double what it was when they came in. Now, students who got good work experience get the highest salaries, and those are the ones who've got the opportunity to get, you know, uh, three times, uh, four times the salary that you may have had when you came in. So the advantage of working is that you're setting yourselves up for a higher salary after the MBA. And even if the salary that you get after your undergrad is not a uh, really high salary, if you get a great experience, you'll leverage that many times over uh, after you get the MBA degree. Thank you. Yeah. The one thing I want to share is I was talking to several members of our admissions committee. This is the committee that looks at all of the applications. And I remember one of them uh, saying to me, if there was one message I could tell these students, it would be this. And that message is, don't use your application and your interview as a way to decide what you want to do in the MBA program. You need to answer and, and, and make everyone on that committee feel like you are passionate about finance, and finance is what you wake up in the morning thinking about and what you go to bed thinking about at night. If you can convince that committee that that's what you're all about, you're a much stronger candidate than someone who honestly might say, you know, I like finance, but I kind of like marketing, I kind of like strategy, and I'm going to use this MBA to, to help me determine what I want to do. It's a kiss of death. Now, the reality is that you can go into finance and decide that finance isn't right for you, but you're already in the program. It's easy to switch to a different program. So that's just one word of advice that I thought you might find helpful. Did you other questions? Okay, good afternoon, Mr. Delaney. Uh, my name is Fudi. Um, to be honest, uh, I have planned to take a continue my study at Michigan State of University. <laughs> but uh, yeah, maybe I can uh, I can tell I can uh, uh, communicate to you uh, uh, personally if it, if it is possible. But um, two things that I want to ask is first uh, about the TOEFL score. Yeah, you you mentioned it before, and then the second thing is about uh, the environment on the on that place about maybe the tolerance of the religion diversity or about the crime. Yeah. Michigan State is a great school. Uh, I was there for six years. I uh, <laughs> love the program. And I can answer your questions in the context of both Penn and Michigan State. Uh, the total score varies a little bit across schools. If you can get 100 on the total score, you will be in a pretty good position at any MBA program. Some schools will accept you with an 80 or a 90, but you should try to get 100 or better on the TOEFL in order to be considered by everyone. If I look at my experience at both uh, Michigan State and at Pitt, I think what you would find is that the environment is quite diverse and tolerant of diversity, uh, both in terms of uh, religion, um, ethnicity, uh, you see Lots of different things on campus. Uh, at Michigan State, uh, there's a mosque that is right at the edge of campus, and the um, Muslim students have a, a regular registered student organization. Uh, most campuses, well, I won't generalize that far, but I'd say at Pitt, and Michigan State, I think you find that the community is quite tolerant. Um, 
There really isn't a huge problem with crime. It's like in any big city, there are things, there are places you have to avoid. There are certain places in Pittsburgh or even in Lansing, Michigan, that if you're there at 3 o'clock in the morning and you're by yourself, you're inviting trouble. But generally on campus, it's very safe. Um, you know, as I look around the campus at Pitt, because we're in an urban environment, uh, I don't see very many instances particularly of serious crime. There's a lot of um, petty crime. Uh, if you leave your laptop out on a desk in a library, it will walk away. But I think that that could happen anywhere. So uh, one thing you can do, though, that may be helpful Schools in the United States have to file a report with the government every year that provides information on crimes that have been committed on campus. And those documents have to be published on the university website. So if you are interested in a school, you can go to its website and you can find that information out. In general, most American campuses are quite safe uh, and I think that you find that there's a great tolerance of diversity. Uh, what I'd encourage you to do, though, is talk to the students there, and in particular, if you're interested in a certain type of diversity, talk to students in that group to make sure that on this particular campus, it's a place where you feel comfortable. I encourage any prospective student, if you have the opportunity to visit a campus, um, no matter what they show you on the web, and no matter what people tell you, the best sense you'll get from a place is going to come from your gut. After you've had a chance to look around the campus, to talk to some of the faculty and students, and just get a sense for what it's like. Because you'll probably have at that point a reasonable sense of whether you feel comfortable there. And that ultimately is the most important issue because you're the person who has to wake up there every day and to feel comfortable. Um, but I would say you couldn't go wrong at either Pitt or Michigan State. I've got many colleagues back at, at State. It's a wonderful school. And we've got a very strong program at Pitt as well. So you're choosing two winners. And just to, if I could just mention that the student union at the University of Pittsburgh and most student unions at large campuses have a, a, a prayer room for Muslims or people to go in and reflect. Right. So I know we have one in our student union at the University of Pittsburgh. And I'm pretty sure Michigan State would probably have one as well. It's, it's definitely something that most campuses have. Thank any questions? Thank you, Professor. My name is Hugh Hahn. Um, I want to ask you, uh, let's say if we focus on finance in there, and then you mentioned that we have to study two years of liberal arts, so in my opinion, that we know uh, your culture and your ethics and such that. So, uh, so when we work, we know your culture. And then, uh, in my concern, when we uh, took your took the education and we bring it back to start our career in Indonesia, is the theory applicable still well fun in Indonesia? That's a, a really good question. Um, remember that it's for the undergraduate program where there's the two years of liberal arts. Much of the liberal arts education is going to be focused on areas that I think would generalize. We want students to be uh, competent in language, to be competent in math, to have exposure to some of the arts uh, so that you're more of a well-rounded person. Now, I think that you're correct that it's possible that those programs could be leaning towards Western types of thinking and values, and that might be a little bit out of step. I believe that in most schools, you have the opportunity to choose from among a set of these general courses 
that would allow you to choose some that would reflect more on what it was like here in Indonesia. You may even be able to transfer in some credits for something that you have taken here or that you took here in the summer. Uh, I don't know of any schools that are so rigid that they would uh, cause a problem for you that way. Um, what you point out, though, is that you really need to be aware of this issue so that you can judge whether or not the courses you're getting are you know, really reflective of one way of thinking and not another way. Uh, because the economy is global. And to be successful, we have to be able to relate with people across the world. We're going to have to understand cultures and people differently uh, than we might have uh, 50 years ago. Uh, so I think that you can work around it, but that's a very wise comment for everyone to think about because you want to be able to um, replace potentially some of the courses if it's like Western civilization with something else that you believe is going to be more reflective of what you'll experience when you're done and graduate. Uh, thank you, Professor. Uh, thank you. Uh, it's me, Gabriel Okay. Uh, the admissions to, to the MBAs are gener generally associated with what is called GMAP. Yes. Can you tell me more what, what is it? What it is? The GMAP? Yeah, the Graduate Management Admissions Test is uh, essentially an aptitude test that students who are interested in going to graduate business school take. It's like the graduate record examination at GRE, or you may have taken an examination here. It might have been a national examination. In the United States, students take either the SAT or there's another test that they can take. But it's really a measure of aptitude. We ask students to take it because it gives us a single standardized measure that lets us look across everybody who applies to a program. The way that schools look at the test varies. And what it means is that the score you get on the GMAT test is important, but it's going to be more or less important to particular schools. And if you think about that when you're applying, you can, you know, if you don't do as well on the GMAT as you would have liked, you can choose a set of schools where you'll enhance your opportunity for getting in. Because again, for example, we use this leadership test as a way to see uh, the characteristics of students, and we weigh the GMAT less than other schools as a result. Some schools weigh only the GMAT. If you're really interested in the GMAT, you can go to the website of the Graduate Management Admissions Council, GMAC. That's the group that administers the GMAT, and they have information on the test itself, and you can get a, a variety of um, reasonable information that way. Uh, it's easy to purchase and not that expensive different software packages that have sample GMAT tests on them. Uh, I encourage people to study for the GMAT because you can do better on the test if you're familiar with it. And uh, just if you look at it that way, it's not like an IQ test. It's really just an aptitude test. It focuses more on quantitative types of reasoning and analysis, probably more so than the uh, verbal and writing types of analysis, though those components are built into it. for me to apply for a government institution that will send me to a certain 
uh, in this course. Like this, uh, he said it will be easier for me if I only accredit with certain government institution and. Uh, from what I know, uh, some of my other friends are being sent to Pittsburgh. Uh, is it true that it will be easier for me to apply for certain school and finish Pittsburgh if I own work for the government? I think that you have opportunities, if you work for the government, I think you have opportunities at many schools. It's the quality of the job that you have that's most important. And uh, what some, one thing that I'd encourage any international student to think about with regard to this is if you are interested in business, you want to be careful about going to schools that are public and international affairs schools. Uh, because I've talked to some of the international students who graduated from our public and international affairs school, and what they found was that they had difficulty getting internships and the types of job opportunities they wanted, and after the fact decided they should have gotten an MBA degree instead. I, I believe that you could, um, I think that your father's advice is sound, Today, though, I believe that you could be a little more broad. It would be possible to get to that other set of schools without having to be focused on the government service. Uh, and I think that that just means you should focus on the areas that you believe will give you the best experience and, and help position you for the career that you want, and then use that to jump into the uh, MBA program at whatever school is going to be the one that helps you in that career. I think that there's a little more flexibility now, and the main reason is that uh, the MBA market is more competitive than it used to be. And as a result, students have a little bit more power in the market, so you've got more opportunities than would have been the case probably 20 years ago or 10 years ago. So you've got the advantage of that right now, and I think that gives you um, more options in the process. Okay. Um, I would like to ask about the faculty member. Uh, if you want to develop the student that you have also to develop the faculty, what kind of uh, facilities or support that you provide to the faculty so they can keep up with the industry and the business? So, because usually the student is improving much, increasing, uh, increasing. Uh, we try to provide faculty with the support that they need so that they can go to the conferences during the year that they would want to attend, that they have uh, available to them enough resources so that they can get databases they need to do their work, uh, and we encourage faculty to uh, be on the boards of the leading journals as a way of connecting in the field and being aware of what the top scholarship looks like. We encourage faculty to be involved in business in the community so they have a sense of what's going on in the business environment. All of those things allow faculty to stay on top of developments. And I'm really happy with the faculty that uh, we have. I think that they're excellent. And it's a nice mix of both practical and theoretical education that you'll get at the CAD school. Um, it, and it varies across universities and across the world effectively. Uh, but I'd say that we offer our faculty, as Dean, I'd say I probably offer more than they ever would be. Uh, to be successful, but they really use the resources well. And I've been very pleased with uh, what the faculty have done. Uh, we hired uh, a new faculty member away from NCI two years ago who's in the social media area, and he has been a phenomenal addition uh, and works with many of our students on you know, social marketing. How in the world do you measure Facebook and opportunities that come from that? doing it, and in many ways, we try to have that group of faculty that are at the edge on some of these projects, too, because that gives us more ability to help students who are going to go out there and have to deal with the social media and their jobs. Um, 
but it's primarily to try to get to that and be what they need to be successful. For the next question, does the scholarship be provided the scholarship from the school, or is there any other scholarship outside, so from external institution, is that linked with your school? Um, we have a variety of scholarships that are within the school that we give out. We also have some students that have been sponsored by the governments. Some students, they get uh, scholarships from local organizations. Uh, there are like Rotary Club scholarships that students get. There's a wide variety. We work with students if they uh, are trying to get a scholarship from a local organization. I've written many recommendation letters to local Rotary Clubs on behalf of students to help them get those scholarships. Um, the best way to understand scholarships is to look at the website and then to ask the school. And I'll give you an example. We've got, uh, it's a very interesting scholarship that was given to the school probably 50 years ago. And it's for individuals who are of the Lutheran faith. And it can only go to Lutherans. And uh, for people who meet the criteria, um, you get a 75% scholarship uh, for your program. So there's, this is something that you know you wouldn't normally see. It's not advertised on the website, but if students ask us about scholarships, we'll say that this is one of the scholarships that we have. You should look to see what's out there because there might be something that's unique to you. It might be from the place that you grew up. They have a scholarship for students to uh, study in a certain field. And if you look at that, you can find those resources that will help you be successful in your program. And financial aid is really important. Mm -hmm. I'll let you know. that it's 